Ah, he has arrived. Nice and early. Hopefully we shall, uh, how do I log on? Uh, I've sent you an invite or you can press one of the, I think one of the buttons at the bottom also um, sends out an invite to um, come on. So hopefully you either get the invite or one of the buttons should allow you to come on. Ah, Mr. Moss has arrived in the building. Good afternoon, Alison. Waved at her. We are now just awaiting the arrival. Oh, a little wave back from Alison. Hopefully, a couple of one minute we should have. There we go. Here we go. What's up, man? Ah, oh, here we go. How that was you? not easy. I, was, I think it was the first time doing this, so I, uh, I'm kind of a rookie at it. I'm all over the Zoom meeting, but at this I'm still a rookie at it. <laughs> I thought you were an expert. An expert at this, I thought you did it last night. <laughs> no, hey. the Zoom thing. I do Zoom all, all the time, but this is uh, this is my first time on the Instagram thing. Oh, ah, well, an exclusive then. I know. <laughs> <laughs> an exclusive. Yeah. I um oh after I'd done about two of these, someone sent me a message and said, You need Dr. Scott Lynn on. You need Dr. Oh. Scott. I was like, Okay, I'll look into that one. Perfect. Okay. So, Sounds good. Thought, Where are you located? Um England. Oh, cool. What part of England? Uh, basically in the Midlands, between okay. sort of Manchester and Birmingham, right in the okay. middle. So, yeah. uh, you know, where, where, where everyone's locked in. Right. Well, everyone's locked in all over the world right now. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, my brother lives in North London, so I, I'm in the UK often. So. Oh, okay. We're probably yeah. two and a half hours north of that. But yeah, I've, I've done it. Uh, Liam Mucklow and I did an event in Birmingham couple of years ago so i flew into gatwick and took the train up there and yeah so i kind of familiar with that area a little bit but perfect yeah and what what i thought was we could have a little little chat about some of the some of the work you've done okay related to the to the biomechanics um and the the ground force stuff yeah i i spoke to um dr kwan last night okay cool it. he was yeah. he but I just like how different people perceive different things and different um, approaches to the to the subject. You know what I mean? Awesome. So, yeah, oh, perfect. All right. This is going to be really interesting because I, I, I see you been out there with the players a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, through my association with Swing Catalyst, I've had access to a lot of uh, really good teachers and a lot of uh, really good players too. So it's been interesting to see what uh, you know some of the best in the world are doing. Um, because, again, I think there's some things we can learn from some of the best in the world and some things that, you know, I was almost Sean Foley yesterday and we were talking about a couple of things that Justin Rose does. And he said, if I tried that, I'd end up in the hospital. Like, I just can't, there's no way my body would be able to do that move. And so I think it's really understanding, you know, each individual that's standing in front of you and what is going to be optimal for them. Because even in the best in the world, we see a ton of variability in what they do. Um, everybody asks me, you know, like, what should the center of pressure curve look like? What should the ground reaction forces look like? And 
at the start, I was like, I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing so much variability in what people are doing. Um, and that's been true of any of the work that I've done in golf. Like there's, I don't think that's a surprise to anyone, right? You walk up and down a PGA Tour driving range and you see a lot of different things happening, but uh, producing a lot of good golf shots. So it's, uh, it's really important, I think, for the golf teacher to understand that and say, like, I mean, and some of the best teachers in the world I've ever watched, you know, two lessons right after each other could be the opposite lesson. They could say, are you, you, I want you to tuck your elbow and get it closer to your body. And the next person, I want your elbow far away from your leg. So there's, that's the cool thing, I think, is when, is when a golf teacher can, you know, doesn't have a, a preference and they just, uh, you know, match up the, the mechanics to that human standing in front of them. Because, um, I mean, all of our bodies have millions of degrees of freedom. And, you know, we all have little injuries and restrictions and, and we've used our bodies in different ways. We've learned different sports, I think. Um, a lot of the way my own golf swing works is because I grew up in Toronto, Canada. And uh, the first time I think my dad told me I was three or four years old, uh, as, long, as soon as I could stand up long enough without falling down, first thing athletically I did was he put skates on me and sent me out on the ice to play ice hockey. And so the way that I, that my body tries to create speed with a stick in my hand comes from whatever. I still play ice hockey in an old man league in Los Angeles. So um, it's been 30 plus years of me trying to produce speed with a stick in my hand on ice, which is, I mean, you can't use the ground the same way on ice as you do on regular ground. So I think that motor pattern is ingrained in me. And, and for those people, cause you know, the, the whole get open to it kind of torquey rotational type swing has been really in vogue. And I, I, I struggle like crazy with that um, because I, I didn't grow up, uh, you know, I grew up trying to produce speed on skates. And if you think about with knives on your feet on ice, it's really hard to produce rotation if you understand how rotation is produced. And so um, does that mean that I'm just going to be an awful golfer? No, I think I can make matchups and make my particular lower body action still work. Um, and so um, that's, that's kind of the thing that I've been learning that, you know, the, the, the best thing in the world for your swing could be the worst thing in the world for my swing. And we need to make sure that we, we make those matchups accordingly. And I had turned, you know, when I started working with all these great teachers, I had people, you know, do, oh, it's all about matchups, but then, okay, what do you mean by matchups? And, you know, some people talked about, you know, if there's five steepeners, I got to add a couple shallowers to make sure it doesn't get too steep. So I've heard people talk about matchups in that direction, but uh, I think we're now starting to understand like matchups between pressures and, and ground reaction forces and how that um, can relate to, um, you know, getting the most out of your particular golf swing based on your body and how it's working and how it's moving and, how you learn to move and all that messiness in your head. Cause that's a, that's an important thing too. I've worked with some tour players where we can get them, you know, 10 to 12 miles an hour extra on their driver within a couple minutes. But then they're like, yeah, I don't like that so much. Cause the ball's curving a little left. And like, I'm like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like uh, I'm going to have next week on our, on our swing catalyst podcast, we have Lucas Glover coming on with his coach, Ter uh, uh, sorry, Tony Ruggiero. And we were just, just before the players championship a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, we were working with him and like, if he hits a shot that starts like one foot left of the target and lands one foot left of the target, he's pissed off. He hates it. Like, he has to have that ball starting right of the target and drawing a little bit. He would way rather have it start 30 feet right of the target and draw 15 feet and have a 15 footer than hit it and pull it one yard and have a, a three footer. Um, and I'm like, what? Like, what are you talking about? But that's just, you know, what's going on in his head. And I think that's what we got to, we got to realize that every single human in front of us is, is different in there and they have mental trauma. They have physical trauma. They have different segment lengths. They have different movement patterns. They have, there's like millions and millions of billions of degrees of freedom. And I think that's your goal as a golf teacher is to figure out the, the messiness of that human being that's standing in front of you. Uh, giving a golf lesson and try to optimize it and, and even you know the op the most optimal biomechanical pattern for every single person may not work if their if their mind says no i don't like that um, and you got to find a better way to do it and if you have a bunch of tools available to you to to alter things and make it match up for however they want to do it then i think you can you can su succeed with everyone um, i mean the only the only commonality between top players is is how much speed they produce yeah, I mean, I think we can we can make some commonalities between top players in terms of, yeah, like speed, and most of them probably hit it somewhere near the center of the face. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say that's probably one of the commonalities, but if we talk about pass and angle <laughs> attacks and low points, and they're all over the map, right? Like, I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, obviously, you know, there probably isn't a tour player whose low point with an iron is, you know, close to the ball. <laughs> like, it's probably going to be in front, I think. So there are some things we can say with launch monitors, I think, that, that are somewhat common between, between – uh, 
between tour players and really good players. But uh, I think in terms of how the body moves to create those impact conditions can be extremely variable. And that's what I found. And, and the, the interesting thing is, though, you know, how do you, um, how do you look at um, the, the data relative to the person to decide what to do? Yeah. Um, and that's where, like, in statistics, we call it something um, it's called cluster analysis. So if I always think of if you have like an X, Y scatter plot and, um, you know, if you have a really strong correlation, there's a line and all the data points fall right on that line. Right. Which means that if I adjust this variable, then I'm going to get more of this variable. And if I make less of this variable, I'm going to get less of that. But any population of golfers that I've ever measured, it's a big cluster. It's just everywhere. And so if there's just a big mess of stuff, you got to put a little box around somebody. And that's what we call cluster analysis. So this little group here, it looks like if I drew a line through them, oh, there actually is a correlation within this tiny little group here. And so what is it that's different about this group here who looks like this and that group there that looks like that? And so um, that, that's, what I, that's what in science we call cluster analysis. And that's what, uh, I mean, the first golf teacher that I ever saw that, that had a system of, of performing that cluster analysis type thing was Mike Adams. And so he has those those tests that he puts people through that, that try to put people in little groups. And so, and once you figure out this, this, and this, okay, now I can teach these types of mechanical things to you because that's going to work for you. And once you teach this, this, and this, if that person has this, this, and this, then, um, and so some of the work that I've been doing is to try to um, examine a lot of those tests. And, and the ones that I've focused on mostly are the lower body tests because it relates mostly to how the, the feet work with the ground. Um, I know, you know, Sasho and Dr. Kwan do a lot of stuff on the other end, the hand and the club end, but I'm kind of leaving that to them um, and, and focusing on the, the foot ground stuff, especially because of my um, connection with Swing Catalyst. And so... What do, you um, think, what do you think creates the biggest effect on foot pressure? Um, to me, I think it's, uh, it's basically what your most dominant leg is or your strongest or most dominant leg will help determine, will help to determine the variability in how you use the ground. And so... Um, I always tell people like, if you look at the, and so if you look at like a center of pressure curve and most people have seen those now, right? Cause body tracks yeah. showing a bunch yeah. of stuff and um, every really good player I've worked with, um, like, cause when I first started teaching for swing catalyst, everybody would see these center of pressure curves and they're like, what should they look like? And I think, you know, at one point some people started saying, oh, they should be linear because every good player has a linear center of pressure trace. And then I looked at my data and I was like, Justin Rose, JB Holmes, Tommy Fleetwood, Matt Wolf, uh, Victor Hovland and none of these people had linear center pressure traces and they're crushing it and winning golf tournaments and and I'm like okay so that doesn't really equal out in my head and so um, so I wanted to dig into the individual parts of the center of pressure curve and figure out where is it that that things are kind of consistent and and what I found was the maximum movement of the pressure towards the trail side like how much it gets into the trail side is is something that is really super consistent uh, within one player. So I remember we had Tommy Fleetwood come to the Bay at TPC Sawgrass, where we do a lot of our data collections every year. And he hit uh, three six irons and three drivers. And I think his maximum movement in the, in the tint of the trail side was within one or 2% on every single one of those six swings with three different clubs and three different, very and different types the, of clubs. And is the different percentages into that foot with different clubs? Um, similar percentage with that swing uh for tommy fleetwood it was really consistent like he was i think he was like 75 percent into his trail side with his wedge 77 with his six iron and 76 with his driver or something like that so he was like super consistent and and i think there are some because i have a bunch of justin rose swings as well and like justin rose when he's hitting a full shot is always around 80 percent into his trail side but then i have some swings at him with like a nine iron where he stays a much further left so uh he doesn't get as much when you say it goes into the trail side, mm -hmm. which, which are we talking that it's a trail side into the middle of the foot or the heel? That depends. There's a whole bunch of variability in that as well. So like where it is, it heel to toe is different. Rotation. Yeah. Yeah. So that depends on how much rotation, but I'm just looking at, because to me, like pressure is a good measure of the relative use of each foot, right? Because if I get 75% into of my pressure into my right foot and I have 25% of my left foot, and now I go to try to create some 3D ground reaction forces, whether it's like a horizontal glidey try to, or a torque or a, or a vertical force, well, the relative contribution of each of my legs to creating those forces is going to be relative to how much pressure is on each foot. And so um, I think really good players figure out what works for them. So um, 
I think it was Mike Adams was telling me, I haven't seen the data, but he was telling me Bryson DeChambeau, his maximum pressure movement towards the trail side is like 50%, 52% or something like that. So he barely gets into his right side at all. And so for me, and then the opposite end of the spectrum is JB Holmes, where JB Holmes gets 100% into his trail side. So I have some data where literally he's right up on his toe and he's hardly even, I mean, the toe's on the ground, but he's not pushing through it at all. All of his pressure is on the right side. So those are completely different animals. Bryson DeChambeau and JB Holmes are completely different humans they obviously and and my mind being a scientist i was like there has to be something we can measure about jb holmes that's way the heck different from bryson dechambeau and to me this is where i started looking into um the science behind dominant legs and, and how do we decide what our strongest or most dominant leg is and in the academic literature it's it's scattered all over the place with tests that people have used um the, the kind of one that i'm the biggest fan of but this used the most often is people ask like what like do you kick a ball and maybe for people in the UK, that might be a good test because, but the only problem is if you're kicking with your right, your left is your stable leg that's producing a lot of that power that ends up coming out on the right foot. So there's, it's messy. Like there's so many different ways to define it. Um, one of my favorite studies that did that is um, they brought people into a lab and they were kind of standing around and somebody snuck up behind them and pushed them. And so if you get pushed forward, I mean, the first goal of our brain is to not fall on our face and not hurt ourselves. And so if you get pushed from behind and you're going to fall on your face, you're going to find your strongest and most quick dominant leg to stop yourself from, from falling. And so I think that's the way I've heard that that's a way that uh, some other sports like uh, snowboarding decide what leg should be on what part of the board is they just shove you and see what leg catches you. But, um, and so we've been working on some tests for golf that help us determine in golf what's our dominant leg or strongest leg. And, and so to me, Bryson DeChambeau, if he's only getting 50% into his trail side, like basically like he's staying super left the whole time then he, his left leg must be quite a bit stronger than his right and jb holmes who gets 90 percent into his or 100 percent into his trail side his right leg has to be i mean has to be or else i mean he he wouldn't be able to get off that thing and he'd be stuck over there and so um that's my hypothesis i haven't been able to measure you know all the good players in the world because unfortunately the good players in the world a lot of them will let you measure it but like <laughs> yeah. they, don't, they don't let you like mess around with it too okay. much right so um, so our hypothesis right now is what they're doing is kind of matching what their bodies are built for because why, well, I, I mean, they're playing at the highest level. I'm sure they've kind of, um, kind of figured that out. But, and so, I mean, when I first started, you know, learning golf as a kid, you know, everybody taught you move into your right side in the backswing, you move into your left side in the downswing. And, and on average, I guess that's true, but it's not, but the magnitude in which you do that is going to be dependent on, on how much stronger your legs are. And, um, or how strong or relatively strong each leg is. So is there a correlation between the amount of pressure they put in the right side and the ball flight? Um, generally, yes. Um, but you can, um, so what, what we're finding is generally people who get really far into their right side produce a lot of horizontal force or um, Mike called it a glide force. Mm -hmm. And the glide force we found through some work we did with ping is, is a little or more highly correlated to uh, an inside out swing direction and so obviously you know if I'm, if I'm more of a glider type player I'm going to have a more inside out path or swing direction and so you would say that would generally result in more of a draw shape um, if I'm more of a centered player like if I'm like Justin Rosie stays very centered then I can produce more rotational type motions which generally drags the swing direction around to the left which hopefully will generally create more of a, a, a fade pattern but even within those patterns, we can make alterations in our setup too. Because if you see JB Holmes, who really gets right and then produces a lot of horizontal force, but he stands super open to it, so he can still hit a cut from well, yeah. relative his, to his body is coming from the inside, but the ball doesn't care where your body's aligned, and so he can still hit a cut from that position by altering a couple of little variables. So, um, and that's something that I think you know that really good coaches need to be able to do. You have to have all those tools in your toolbox to to alter pressures right and left, to alter all the little ground reaction forces. And if somebody wants to hit a cut, okay, let's turn up the, the gas on our torque and figure out how to do that and give you some drills. And, and what I've learned from a lot of my motor learning friends is, I mean, if I want to add more torque to your golf swing and I give you a drill that worked in the last guy, it might not work in you because you are a different human and you have different. And so you need to have a whole bunch of different tools available. Um, and that's kind of what I'm working on right now is, is trying to find, you know, some of the best teachers in the world that I know that are using our plates and, and measuring this stuff and, and getting a lot of their drills so that we can have more tools that I can teach people to. Because in the end, I believe, I mean, I think one of the best uh, <clears throat> uses for the ground reaction force plate, the swing catalyst plate, is uh, we have an ambassador in Sweden uh, named Eric Blomquist, who I was over there 
or I was in Norway um, in November and he presented and he showed like a little amplifier on a, on a, uh, or like a sound stage kind of deal. Like, so a, a speaker basically. And so he was saying, you know, like, if you go to see a, a couple bands and say one band's on the stage and then they leave and then before the next band comes on, what happens? A bunch of guys go up there and they retune everything, right? Because the, the settings on that amplifier are going to be different to make that band sound good than it would have been to make the previous band sound good. And so um, really, you're, there's three basic ways you can use the ground to create speed and move the club. You can go side to side or horizontal. You can go torque and you can go vertical. And I think with every golfer, it becomes tuning each of those forces to the individual and figuring out what's optimal for them. And so the other thing is you've got it. It's not it, the, that that ground reaction force that it's measuring to a degree. It, you know, although it, it is it is basically the feet the, the whole body's movement has a has an effect on it, doesn't it? A hundred percent. Yeah. Whether, whether the hands are higher, lower, you know, et cetera. That all, yeah. that all has an overriding effect on it. A hundred percent. And that's where um, like you can give people like club related cues and that can change the ground reaction forces. Or you can give people foot-related cues and that can change the club. And so I think you have to realize, you have to have all those tools in your toolbox because like you could tell me something about my feet and it might not work for me, but you tell it comes to you, you know, you could give them uh, a, a club cue and it doesn't work, but the foot cue works better. So. Um, everybody responds differently and everybody, you know, their brains process information differently. And so I think to me, like pretty much all of our cues we've ever had in golf have been kinematically related, right? So we've been talking about position of segments. We've been talking about, you know, wrist angle, whatever. And so, and why was that? Because all we had available to us in the past was kinematic measurement tools, right? All we could measure was with our eyes or with our iPhones or with our whatever. Uh, and now that we have kinetic measurement tools, like, like, uh, ground reaction force plates and pressure plates, then now we can come up with cues from the other end as well. And, and I think if you're just a golfer who, or a golf teacher who only has ground reaction force cues, you're not going to be very good. And if you're a golfer who, teacher who only has kinematic club related cues, you're not going to be very good. And so it, you got to have all the tools to help everyone. Cause if you, again, if you, you know, if all you have in your toolbox is a hammer, you're only going to be able to fix a couple of things, right? Or <laughs> if you have yeah, yeah. all the other tools. And, and I, I've always thought when, and we've used uh, pressure plates for, for quite a long time. I always think that you can you can match the pressure trace with with the arm swing, and I think you can change the pressure trace in terms of where the pressure is to almost stimulate the muscle groups you want to fire through the ball. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, I, I remember you. You know, and this is just observation that. If if you got if you got a player who stood on some some plates and their their pressure was right in the middle of a base of support, yeah. they'd be really, they 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 could well be really well balanced, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't necessarily be that that fast. No, but no. There's other right? other players whose pressure is almost towards the toes, right? Almost to the point where they're falling over, you know. And and that far forward, you're thinking, wow, you're going to engage a completely different muscle group. To, to this other guy, right? Right. These ones who were right on the toes, some of they were the ones who create the most force. Right, but they could also be the ones that are the wildest too, or you know, maybe don't get the center yeah, of the yeah. as much. So, and that's what I, I, I mean, I talk about in anything. It's always a continuum, right? There. I mean, to me, for every single human, and I learned this when I um, took undergrad sports psychology, right? When they talk about arousal levels and performance, they have an inverted U hypothesis, right? So there's a certain amount of arousal level where I perform my best. If I get way too excited, I don't perform so well. And if I'm way too relaxed, I don't perform so well. And I think that's true of arousal levels in sports psychology. It's true of the amount of horizontal force in your golf swing. It's true of the amount of pressure shift in your golf swing. Like there, every single person has a certain level. And, and remember like in sports psychology, you know, if you're like a NFL football player, you probably need to be way over here, right? You got to be pretty hyped up to play that game. But if you're a dart thrower, you better be kind of over here, right? To play that game. And, and then with it, within every NFL player and every dart thrower, there's little adjustments that have to be made, right? Because like some people play better, you know, you see like the guys that, that like playing in Phoenix, the, the golfers that like playing in Phoenix are generally the guys who are, you know, get like to get a little more hyped up. The guys who like don't mind noise in their backswing and like, but there's some guys who just hate playing in Phoenix, right? Because it's such a rowdy, crazy environment. Um, and so I think, you know, players figure out what courses work best for them. Players figure out what, you know, environments work best for them to play well. And I think 
we can figure out what biomechanics works best for us too because it's it's always different the other the other thing I, I think is fascinating with this subject is that you could have someone just make a stock swing and and have a, a certain trace from yep. let's say right to left you could then ask him to hit a lower shot a higher shot a draw a fade right mm -hmm. and and have them dis show different skills right? yeah and also be able to work out why they can't hit certain shots yeah no 100 percent. Yeah. The, the the mix of those forces through the floor yeah and i think that's uh that's what my good friend uh, john dunnigan calls the goldilocks method of teaching golf so um, I remember when I, I struggle with a hook, like, cause I don't rotate very well and my path can get really inside out and I can hit some pretty big snappers sometimes. Um, and I remember when I first started doing that, I was working with my buddy, Will Wu, who's a, a motor learning expert. And, um, we got on the tee and he's like, okay, hit your, your, you know, the, the thing we've been working on to try to get rid of that hook. And I was like, and I started hitting a couple of good ones. He's like, okay, now I want to hook, want you to hook one off the planet. And I was like, wait, wait, like, didn't I tell you like I hate hooks? And he's like, no, but if you understand and you can do it on cue, and then if you can slice it off the planet on cue, then your body, your brain finds the middle a lot easier. And so um, most of the time, you know, in a golf lesson, if you find somebody's ingredients, my buddy Will calls it. So you find what works best for them and they start pounding it. What do you do at the end of it? You high five them and they leave, right? Where now I think the point when you find it and they're hitting it good, you can say, okay, now go back to your old swing. Try that old thing again and see if you can reproduce it. And now try the complete opposite of that and try to reproduce that. And then, and so our brains are really good if it knows the edges at finding the middle. But if all we do is stay in the middle the whole time, then it becomes hard to calibrate that when we're on the first tee the next day. And, um, and we have to do it under pressure or there's, you know, a right to left wind and a right to left slope and water's left. And, you know, that's, that's a whole different animal. And, and it's so, always interesting looking at what their habits are under pressure. Yeah, 100%. And that's, the, and, that's one thing that, you know, is still, um, we, we can't work out. The moment they're stood on the 18th tee, you know, water down the left, you know, winds howling one way, got yeah. to be able to hit the shot. Yeah. That's when, yeah. you, you know, you see how, see how players' bodies react to the... 100%. To and absolutely. that's, I think, where you, you, a lot of times you'll go back to your, and, uh, like, a generalized motor program, right? Whatever's ingrained in your brain and those times when, you know, you're under extreme pressure and there's, like, a whole bunch of elements happening, generally you go back to whatever your body's really comfortable with and... Uh, um, I remember uh, I was talking to Sean Foley yesterday on our on our webinar, and he said that uh, the four iron that that Justin Rose hit into the uh, the last green at Marion to win the U.S. Open, it was like two thirty into the win. And like there was all these conditions happening around, and he, he says that Rosie can't watch that swing because he hates it. He's like, it's so ugly. It's like everything that he's trying to work against, but in that extreme pressure, somehow he made it happen, even though it was not the swing that he likes or the swing that he does all the time, and so. Yeah, that to me, like, because I've seen enough now and working with Mike Adams and a whole bunch of people, like, it's it's not super difficult if you understand the matchup to get people hitting it better, like, in the moment on, you know, on a flat lie or on a piece of turf with, the, you know, with no wind and da, 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 whatever. But um, then how do you get that to stick, you know, the next day on the first tee or, you know, two days later when they're in the middle of fairway with 50 bucks on the line or whatever it is. And, I mean, you know, these the, the, these guys have got to take – the information of, of hitting the ball mm -hmm. and then use the, the ground reaction force data as another ingredient to help right. produce what, produce what we want. And right. I've found over the years, players like the feel of being a little more here, a little more there, because a lot of their feels in the hands, especially yeah. good players, you know, yeah. play for, I don't know, 20 years and they've got all this feel in the hand. The moment they have to move, maneuver the hands or put them in a different position, they find it difficult to put the club back to the ball. Right. But if you if you, if you said to them, look, you know, if you can put your pressure start a bit further forward or a little bit, you know, that's a lot easier for them to to manage. I agree, and they I think there's there's kind of like yeah, and I think the there's got there's I mean I'd have to talk to my buddy Will Wu about that, but there's got to be a motor learning theory that supports that. You know, like people probably learn better by you know or it makes it easier because there's less degrees of freedom, right? Like the little, a little motion at the club, changing that face by, you know, five degrees could create a massive effect where, um, you know, the feet are a lot further away from the club and they could, you know, create some kind of a change. And so, um, yeah, I think that's, I mean, you have to have all those tools, right? You still have to have your, your club tools. And that's why I think, you know, all the research between the hands and the club are, is super important. Like we have to understand that stuff because 
Because really, I mean, your, your job as a golf teacher is manipulating those two external connections that we have, right? As our feet on the ground, and our hands on the club, those are the two things that we're, we're connected to. And so um, understanding all that stuff, I think, is super important, both ends of it. And uh, I've only worked really from one end of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I read the stuff and I understand the stuff at the other end, but I just don't do much work in that area. And this, 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 this ground reaction force, right, has actually mm -hmm. changed quite a bit I mean, over the last few years. Because, I mean, a few years ago when we were using basic pressure plates, we only mm -hmm. had left foot and right foot pressure and a combined yeah. line in the middle that, yeah. that moved the ground. You know what I mean? So yeah. everything was very much, well, there you go. There, there wasn't the, you know, the, the different talks and... Yeah. Well, and I think... Yeah. That, I, I always make the, because when golf teachers ask me, I always make the comparison to launch monitors. So um, like a body track mat or a pressure plate is kind of like a flight scope Mevo, right? It gives you some information, right? It gives you club head speed. It gives you smash factor. It probably gives you ball speed, but it doesn't give you angle of attack. It doesn't give you path. It doesn't give you closure rate. It doesn't give you, right? And so that's to me like, and so you have to start somewhere. And so obviously a flight scope Mevo, if you don't have a launch monitor, is a great place to start. It gives you some information. Um, but then, you know, obviously what's the upgrade was well, to get to like a Trackman or a Foresight or a flight scope um, yeah. to get more information. And so, and to me, I think the launch monitor companies have done such a good job of education because, uh, I remember it was, I think it was 2008. I went to Orlando and I was hanging out with Sean Foley and we were on the driving range and I was hitting some shots and he pulled this little red box out and he put it behind my ball and I hit a shot and all these numbers popped up and I was like, great, but the hell do they mean? <laughs> like, I have no idea. Right. right? And, and if you think about it, back in 2008, like 12 years ago, how many golf teachers had a launch monitor? Sean Foley had one, but I don't know too many others that did, right? And so now we're in 2020, and I would say, you know, the Sean Foley's of the world are the ones who have the grand reaction force plates. But if we go ahead to 2028, I'm, I'm going to bet a lot of money that there's a lot of, um, that there's going to be a similar amount of golf teachers that have it. It's just such a valuable tool. And the only way that we can make this tool as valuable to everyone is the education, right? And the research and the education. Yeah. So when, when, you know, we started learning about the ball flight laws and we started learning about the D plane and we started learning about that, that's what made, and then the education that the launch monitor companies did is what made those tools an essential teaching tool. And so I think that's really my role is to do that educate or that research and then that education. Cause I mean, doing the research is fine if I understand the physics of the ground reaction force, but I have to be able to explain it to somebody like you or somebody like Tony Ruggiero yeah. or somebody like Sean Foley and have everybody be able to still understand it and use it the way that they want to. And, and that's, that's a challenge. It obviously, I mean, that's why it's, you know, take, it's going to take us some time, but um, just watching, you know, guys that really know how to use this tool, use it with some of their players. Um, it, it's just such. How, how do the best, how do the best use it? Um, I mean, there's lots of different ways, but I think, I mean, to me, um, Mike, you know, Mike Adams, I've seen him use it a ton. And so he'll have people hit some shots to start with, and then he'll test them. So he'll do some assessments on their body and then, you know, make a hypothesis about, um, how they should be using the ground relative to how their body works. And then he'll see if there's mismatches or not. And then he'll obviously give them some, um, shoot you know, drills or setup changes or whatever it is. And, and I, I've seen Liam Mucklow do this quite a bit with the plate too. And so, and then have them hit again. And so really your, your litmus test of whether you've made the correct hypothesis on whether they're using the ground correctly or not is a launch monitor, right? If the launch monitor starts telling you better things, like the pass starts off at 14 left and they're hitting these over the top big slices and, and it comes back closer to zero and the face gets a little square and this club head speed goes up. I mean, and low point moves a little further ahead and like, if you start seeing better impacts some close to the center of the face, you're like, oh, cool, I guess I'm onto something. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think that the really good ones are much better at making that initial assessment to determine what's optimal for people. But if yeah. you don't have that initial, if you're not really sure about that initial assessment, then it becomes a, you know, and I like, I mean, because I'm such a scientist, I like um, kind of the scientific method, which is what, well, you do some assessments, you create a hypothesis, you test it. And based on the results of that hypothesis, you create another hypothesis and you test that and then it goes on and on. And so to me, if you make a hypothesis and you test it, like say that you think this guy needs more torque in his golf swing. And so, okay, cool. So I give him some drills and why did you decide they needed more torque? There must've been some kind of assessment that went into that. Either you had them swing on the force plate and there was a low amount of torque and then you tested their body and said, oh, you're kind of a centered type golfer. It looks like both your feet are about the same. You know, there's not a big imbalance between right and left. So Okay, I think he, this person needs more torque. 
So now you have a whole whack of tools in your toolbox to try to get them more torque. So you give them some drills, you give them some feels, you, whatever it is, and then you have them get back on the plate and hit. And if you look at the torque graph and it gets higher, you're like, okay, I accomplished goal number one. Like my hypothesis to increase torque has increased, but now let's see, what did the ball do? And if the ball, um, you know, club head speed went up and impact conditions are better or closer towards what you want them to be, you're like, cool, I think I'm on the right track. And then once you're on the right track, it becomes, you know, doing the motor learning training to make sure that they can do that on the first tee, you know, the next day or whatever. But, uh, but if you're on the wrong track, what do you do? Well, you create another hypothesis. Say, okay, well, maybe it's not torque. Maybe we need more vertical force. Okay, here's some vertical force drills. And, and I think um, that's a, a really simple way to use this type of information. And, and the best part about it is you have immediate feedback from the plate after every shot. Okay, what did the ball do? What are all the impact conditions? What did the ground forces look like? What do the pressures look like? Okay, cool. And, and I think a lot of the best teachers, and it depends, but I think a lot of the best teachers that I, you know, they, sometimes they don't say a lot about the ground reaction forces to their clients. Like I've seen a lot of teachers that have that information on a computer screen that they can see, but the client or the student can't see it. And so they just look at it and make some hypotheses and they go over to the student and tell them, the, the simplest stupid thing you'd ever see, like just uh, squash this leaf I put under the ball of your foot on the next one. And, and how did they come to that decision? Well, there's, there's some complexities that allowed them to come to that decision, but they don't relay that information to the player. But I think it really depends. Um, I've found recently, uh, we've been selling some ground reaction force plates, some of our plates to, uh, you know, really rich guys who have, uh, you know, simulators in their basement. And, and most of these guys are, um, I mean, if you're at the point where you can buy a simulator for your basement, um, <laughs> you probably, you know, a pretty analytical person. So most of these guys have money in the stock market and they're used to analyzing trends and graphs. And so these guys love it. They get right into it. They want to come back, and look at each graph and talk about the graph. And I was working with this guy just outside of New York a couple, uh, a couple months ago, I guess it was. And uh, like literally he hit one shot and we'd talk about that one shot for like 30 minutes. We'd go through each graph. We'd go through the launch monitor conditions. We'd go through the pressures. We'd look at the videos. In another shot and it'd be like a 30 minute discussion after that because that's what you know that's what he wanted to do with it right so i think whereas i think i mean i remember what was it like 10 years ago uh, or no five years ago i got to test ricky fowler on the swing cat plate and i remember he walked over and he's like he's like i'll hit one for you on this but he's like don't tell me anything he's like i don't want to know anything um because I'm, I'm you know like those really field type players they don't want to know much and i think those are the type of guys that work well with you know a coach like you know butch Harmon or whatever who will just like you know, because there's a ton of stuff going on on Butch Harmon's head, but he gives you, I'm sure, very simple cues. And, yeah. and that's what's so interesting to me is I've hung around some of the best, you know, best teachers in the world. And like, sometimes it's just the dead, simplest, stupidest thing that they're taught that they're working on with their players. And everyone thinks, oh, they're on the PGA Tour. This must be the most complex. You know, we're talking gamma torques and beta torques and vertical force. And, and a lot of the times that's not the case. They're working on the same stupid stuff that a lot of us, you know, work on. And I think that's where the golf teacher's role comes in to know when does it have to be dead simple? When do you, when can you give them a little more complex stuff? It's uh, it's, it's not uh, I mean, it, it's a tough job you guys have. And I always tell people, you know, if, if golf teaching was easy, like, you know, if there was a magic bullet for everyone and golf teaching was that easy, then you know, everybody would be doing it. And, and I, I think personally, the, the best coaches in the world are like, are just like artists. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and an artist has got a blank canvas in front of him and he knows what it's going to look like. Yeah. Not that, and, yeah. But he knows what it's going to look like before he starts. And, and I think when I talk to some of the best coaches, they know from the moment they've seen that player what they want it to look like. And, right. and, and they, they can then measure to know why each piece doesn't hit that mark. That doesn't, that make, doesn't yeah. appear. Rough. Sure. And I think it's, I mean, in the end, it becomes, comes down to... to to reading human beings like and so being because i mean no matter what kind of a physical coach you are whether you're a strength trainer or a golf teacher or whatever like psychology is just so important right you got to realize what that person needs to so you can be the best biomechanist or mechanical golf teacher in the world but if you can't relate it in a way that 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 human being in front of you can digest it and use it and, and feel better about themselves when they do it and you know, there's so many factors there. And so, I mean, I think that's what makes this fun, right? Every single person that gets in front of you every single day is a little puzzle to solve. Um, and if that makes you, because when I first started working for Swing Catalyst and I, I started telling them, hey, like all these people that I see are doing different things. And, and this was at the point where I think it was Body Track was telling everyone that a linear center pressure trace is perfect. And 
and I went to back to swing callus and I created this whole education content around everybody's different. And, and like, they kind of were like, Oh, that's a terrible golf. Like that's a terrible model for our education program. Cause everyone's going to get frustrated and everyone's going to get overwhelmed. And I was like, but it's the truth. So if you want me to do it, that's what we're doing. And they're like, okay, let's go with it. And, and I think we've now made it. Cause I mean, I think when I first started doing it and I, t I tell this, I told the story yesterday with Sean Foley, people, you know, would ask me a question, what should the center pressure trace look like? And I'm like, I don't know. It depends. And what should the ground reaction force look like? Well, I don't know. It depends. And I used to just stop there. And then, but then what's the logical next question? Well, it depends on what. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. that's the, that's the research that I've been doing now is saying, well, if this and this and this, then we want this. And if that and that and that, then we want that. And so um, I think that's kind of been my role to try to do. And in the end, it, it's really, like I talked about at the start, it, it's, it's a cluster analysis issue with every single human population. Um, and so like, cause I, I read all the literature and Dr. Kwan just published a study on ground reaction forces and his correlations were, were not strong. They were very weak, uh, which means a lot of people are doing different things. And so um, it doesn't mean that the information is bad. The information is great. It's just figuring out what human being needs this and what human being needs that. And, and let, let's go back to where we started. Every human being is different. hundred percent they are. You know, the, those pressures, um, chain the the way in which they apply pressure to the floor and use it, and the timings of it are massively yeah. different from player to player. I suppose uh -huh. the big big issue is when that doesn't match what the intention of the shot is. The intention, sure, and what that human body can do optimally. So, like, I mean, if you're getting ninety percent of your pressure into your trail side, and I test your body, and your right leg is a lot weaker than your left you're probably putting yourself at a disadvantage by getting that much into your trail side. So the relative contribution of each leg is something that I think is one of the most important factors you should know. Um, and when I first started doing research in biomechanics, it wasn't in golf. It was in knee arthritis biomechanics. And, um, and then I started doing some personal training. So I started to get into the training world. And um, in the training world, people always said, you know, if you're imbalanced, that's a risk for injury, right? If I'm like, you know, way stronger on my right than my left, I'm going to get injured probably. And, and I started reading that stuff and kind of understanding, I'm like, okay, that's okay. Um, and also in my work with the university, I work with NHL hockey teams or ice hockey teams. And uh, I think it was five years ago, I was doing, I started doing the testing for the Anaheim Ducks, which are uh, an ice hockey team right near my university. And when I first did the testing, we did a bilateral vertical jump as a test and they had each foot on a separate force plate. So we could see how much contribution of their bilateral vertical force came from each foot. And there was one guy who had like 75% of his force coming from one foot and 25% of his force coming from the other foot. And I put a, you know, a star next to him. And I was like, Oh, when I see the management, I got to tell them that they make sure they watch this guy because he's a high risk for injury and da da da. And so I remember I got, well, he's not the best player, uh, like, you know, skill wise, but he's, he never gets injured. He, he was like, I think he played 800 straight games and never got injured. So he had the record in the NHL for the most straight games played without ever being injured. And he lost that record because he slashed a guy in the head with his stick and got suspended. So it wasn't because he got hurt. <laughs> That's hockey for you, though. <laughs> That's ice hockey for you. But um, And so I, I ended up testing him five other times because I've been doing it for five years. And every year he's the same. And every year he goes out and he doesn't get hurt. And, he, and so I think, to me, making a generalized statement that everybody needs to be balanced is, is not correct. Because some human beings are probably balanced at 75% on one leg and 25 on the other. That probably works for them. Because my hypothesis is if we, because we just left them alone. We're like, cool, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Like, it's all good. Like, and if we had done a lot of exercises with them to try to balance them out and get them more 50-50, my hypothesis is we probably would have hurt them. Because his body, for whatever reason, we don't know what that reason is, right? There's like millions of degrees of freedom in a human body. And who knows why that works for him. But um, that little case study kind of showed me that, hmm. Like, and so that's why, you know, if you're a really left leg dominant person, and your left leg's way stronger than your right. Should you like strengthen your right leg in the gym and work on that? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But for for most of the people that you know, because most people that go for golf lessons, they're not going to go to the gym and work on their imbalances and do all the things you would probably need to do to work out something like that. So as you, as a golf teacher, let's just use our left leg more and, and make it work. And so, but sometimes I think can, those sometimes those imbalances are what make good players. A hundred percent. Yeah, and I think I mean. I'm positive there's something you can measure about Bryson DeChambeau that's different than what you would measure like about uh, J.B. Holmes. And, and to me, those guys are at opposite ends of the spectrum, right? If I put, you know, he would be way over here and that guy would be way over there. And so there's got to be something we can measure about them that's, that's different. You know, when you, you know when you said J um, Bryson DeChambeau had 55% in his role? Uh, 50 something. I don't know the exact number. I haven't seen the data. That that's, just, that's just hearsay. But um, yeah, 
Would that I be think, the maximum that he got there? Or yeah, the maximum he got into his trail side. So like, and generally it happens really early. So um, the, the one that I've seen that I've measured that I used to talk about as being the extreme left end of the continuum was uh, Charlie Wheat, who was, you know, one of the guys that, that did stack and tilt. And, yeah, yeah. and stack and tilt, I think, got some bad rap. But if you're a very left leg dominant, some of those feels are amazing for you. And like, yeah, yeah. so I don't think there's any really inherently bad golf drills or golf instruction because obviously if, if we're hearing about them or if we've heard about them they obviously help somebody at some point um yeah. and so you put those tools in your toolbox and figure out where and when they, they should be used right so like and you know like a hammer is very useful if you have a certain problem but yeah. if you have another problem a hammer is not so useful to you <laughs> you probably want to put that away and get your screwdriver or whatever it is would you see scott a player who maybe have two different traces one for driver and one for irons yeah i mean Generally, if they're hitting a full shot, like a full speed shot, I see very similar. Like, so if they want to hit a full speed shot and they're not trying to flight it down and they're not trying to curve it a certain way, then, then generally the traces are similar. But it's when you get to the controlled clubs because uh, I, I have like Rosie hitting a whole bunch of different shots and his like full six iron and full driver traces are, are relatively similar. It's when he gets like a nine iron in his hand and he's just like flighting and his back one gets a little shorter. And then, yeah, you do see different things. And, and how does that change? Um, generally, the, the more control you have, the less they're going to get into their trail side. So, oh, okay. um, so I've done a little graph that I show quite a bit where I look at the maximum amount of right pressure shift in drivers and irons. And, the, like, and I put the individual players on there and the, the drivers are more towards the right and the, the irons shift a little left. So most people on average, but that's not true for everyone. I think uh, I was just looking at Tommy Fleetwood the other day and his, his driver is like 75% into his trail side and his six iron is 77. So it's a small difference, but it's, it's not, not everybody goes that way, but I think it kind of makes more sense that if you want to be more uh, accurate and maybe have a little less speed staying a little, I mean, you think about it like a chip, like, you know, if I'm going to chip, what's most people would say, well, get on your left side and just stay there. Cause I don't need, you know, a lot of, a lot of movement and, if, and a lot of force coming from the ground to hit it that far. And if they're in a full shot or a, a three quarter shot, if they don't load as much, what, what's the difference then through the ball? Is the left vertical and a little more rotation? Well, that, that would be, uh, uh, that would be kind of, you know, if you're trying to create a full speed shot. Yes. So that's what we say. Like, so if you're a very right dominant player, you got to produce horizontal force or lateral force. If you want to stay very centered, you have to rotate, right? If you want to keep my head still and like, remember the old Ben Hogan things where swing within yeah, the yeah. barrel. If you want to swing within the barrel, you have to rotate, right? You can't translate side to side, you bust through the barrel. So, so a very centered player would be a torque producer, a very right footed player, or trail dominant player would be a horizontal producer. And if I stack up on my left side, I got to go vertical. I got to jump um, to create speed. And so, yeah, I would say um, the further left you, you stay, the more vertical you have to use to produce speed. Um, and, and then obviously, so the further left you stay, the less horizontal and the more vertical you're going to use. And, and then the more you come towards the center. And so that's, and that, that's, that's, that's a good recollection. Cause like that is just tuning those three forces. Like I talked about, right? Like just like you're yeah. tuning an amplifier for a, a guitar player, you're, you're saying, okay, now we want to, you know, hit it, lower and so this is the types of things that we're going to need to do and and i think um you know we have a lot of good cues for hitting it lower in terms of you know club delivery and release lower and all those things but in terms of the feet understanding the matchup i think is really important and and if you then go to these long hitters have you measured any of that i have yeah um and i think i mean long driving to me is kind of a you know a darwinian event right it's survival of the fittest um it's uh because I, I, I've, I remember I told you about the three forces, right? We have the horizontal yeah. force, the torque, and the vertical force. And I've measured, like, I don't know, probably hundreds of PGA Tour players. And there's only – and one thing we do in Swing Catalyst, we put these little black bands on the graph that show us the tour average plus or minus one standard deviation. Because um, I think that really helps the user understand what's a lot of that measure and what's a little. Like, I remember going to Norway for the first time, and, uh, and I went into the bar, and they're like, that beer is – 84,000 kroner. And I was like, oh, how much is that? And I'm like, I don't know. Right. Like, so, so if I told you, you had, you know, 26% of your body weight in horizontal force, what do you tell me? Oh, okay, cool. Is that a lot? Is that a little, I don't know. Like, and so giving people a scale so they can understand these numbers, I think is important. And so looking at those two averages graphs, 
when I first started teaching, and, you know, most people were like, okay, so if I have a player and they're like low in vertical and low in torque, but maximizing horizontal, I should just pump up the torque and the, hor and the vertical to make everything in the tour average and everybody will be good, right? And I was like, I don't know about that because we call them the rare trifectas are the, are the people who get all of their forces at or above the tour average. And we've measured so far, I believe, out of the hundreds of tour players, I think five. So there's five players who actually get all three above all, all their forces above and everybody else, you know, maybe one of them is or two of them are, but not all three. And so um, like Gary Woodland, um, I used to say that all really long hitters have to have a lot of vertical force because every ver every really long hitter I had measured before that had a lot of vertical force. But then we measured Gary Woodland. He has barely any, but he uses a lot of horizontal and torque to hit to smash it and he's one of the longest guys out there and our hypothesis is if we added vertical to him based on the way his body works he would probably lose speed and probably hit it more crooked and so um i think to me to be a long drive hitter you have to have the um ability or your body has to have the ability to be a trifecta to have all three forces in there like um i've worked with uh, you know a bunch of tour players who like i don't think there's any chance they're going to get all three of those forces in the tour average they're never going to be the longest guy out there but they can hit it straight they can make birdies and they can win lots of money but if your whole goal is just to hit it as far as humanly possible i think you have to have the makeup of your physical ability and your anthropometrics and everything to to be a trifecta to put all three forces because i haven't seen a long drive person yet that doesn't have all three forces in the tour average at least um and one of the most impressive things, so Bernie Najar uh, out of the U.S., he's in the Baltimore area, um, works with Kyle Berkshire, the guy who won the, yeah. the long drive last year. And Kyle Berkshire came by our booth at the PGA show to hit some shots on the plate so we could measure him uh, a couple of months ago in January at, in Orlando. Have you ever been to the PGA show in Orlando? No, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So our booth is kind of small. And, and when a guy like that comes up, a whole bunch of people crowd around. And so he gets up on the plate and, like, he had to check in his backswing first before, that he wouldn't hit somebody like there are people who are that close to him um and he still produced like i think it was 200 and something ball speed and 150 club speed and 380 yard carry like it was nuts um but for him it looks relatively um effortless because you see a lot of the long drive guys are like grunting and yelling and screaming yes. but him it, it, it doesn't look as you know like it's taking as much effort and, and one of the things that i found that was super interesting about him was like his his breaking force his horizontal breaking force, so the way that he posts up through that lead leg and stops the horizontal force is was pretty incredible. Um, and so that's something I see, like I would say that's a lot of times you'll see like amateurs that, that produce too much horizontal force that they can't break. And then you see that saggy lead leg and that loses them a lot of speed. So um, to me, what I found from the, from the long drive competitions is uh, the, the ones that I have measured is, you know, you have to be a special human to, to be that, to do that long drive competition. And that special human needs to be able to produce, you know, tour level or above forces in all three directions. Um, and, you, and if and, you, sorry. And Scott, if you, if you look at the, the long hitters on the PGA tour mm -hmm. and you look at the long drive hitters, yeah, the gap between those boys now is probably as narrow as it's ever been in terms of, you know the, the 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 big hitters on the PGA tour, you know, yeah. and and those that that gap's probably getting closer and closer. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know I don't really know the answer to that because I haven't really followed the long drive competition that that closely. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean there are guys on the PGA tour that can pound it out there. But I mean the problem with real golf is you got to go find it and hit it again and uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And i think it'll be really interesting to see when they go back to play if there's no fans around because did you hear um brooks kepka said he thinks guys are going to be losing a bunch of golf balls um because there's not fans <laughs> there to stop them right or to find them when they go in the garbage like so it'll be interesting to see if these guys that really rip at it are maybe a little more careful when there's not fans around to because if you yeah. lose one way off in the weeds, there's probably somebody out there that can find it for you really quickly, or they've trampled down the grass so you can find it really quickly. Yeah. But with no fans out there, it's going to be like, like you and I out there trying to find the thing. And, uh, and so that'll be interesting to see if, if, if maybe the driving distance comes down. It'll be a really interesting thing to talk to like Mark Brody and the Strokes Gain guys to see how, how it changes with no fans out there. So I think that'll be, uh, that'll be something cool to find. Because, I mean, the, the long drive competition is a strange one, right? I think they get 10 balls. Yeah. And you could hit nine, like, off the planet, complete foul balls, like, and hit one in the grid and be world champion. Like, yeah, yeah, whereas yeah. if you're a golfer and you hit nine off the planet and one in the grid, I mean, 
you're going to be a 40 plus handicap. So, yeah, 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 um, yeah. so it's, it's a completely different thing. And, and most of the people that I know that have worked with long drive players, they generally have their long drive swing and then they have their let's play golf swing. And so uh, those are, uh, those are completely different things. So, um, I mean, it is interesting to see how these long guys produce the long swing or the, you know, the maximal club head speeds. But when you're working with everyday golfers, like, uh, I don't think that's very useful to you because, you know, your goal with, you know, Mrs. Haverkamp or whoever it is, is to optimize that body there. And if she's not able to produce all three of those forces and if there's, then screw it, like, forget it. Let's just get her hitting it solidly and in the middle of fairway where she can find it because, you know, golf's yeah, yeah. no fun when you, when you can't find your ball. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> do, do you know what's really interesting? I've spoke to many people now from yeah. all over all over golf. And the interesting thing is that the, the one thing that comes back to everybody is that everybody's an individual. Yeah. An individual problem or puzzle that you sure. have to solve. And Whether I think that... we, yeah, we've given lip service to that before. Like, you know, we've said, you know, um, you know, like you know that everyone's an individual you got to do the thing differently but then you know everybody wants well what's the best drill you can do and so like a lot of people are saying you know, they go on instagram and say hey we got, you got to do this drill or whatever now i'll never do that i mean if i ever do videos like that it'll be hey do this test and if you do this do this and if you do that do that and like so i think we, we do give lip service to oh yeah everybody's an individual but then you go on instagram and say hey i like this drill well yeah, yeah that drill could be the best thing in the world for you or the worst thing in the world for me and so i think um you know, that's where we have to do more than just give it lip service um, and say, and think, you know. I think the other thing is with, with launch monitors, with force plates, with 3D, the, the coach now has more information on the player, mm -hmm. what they actually do dynamically than yeah. ever. Because, you know, although uh, if you work with force plates for a long time, you can probably make a decent guess what's going on. You actually want the facts to, to be able yeah. to tell them what's I, happening. Uh... I don't know about that with force plates. I, I, I get it wrong quite often. Like I'll look at the person and be like, I mean, if you look at Matt Wolf's golf swing where he gets right up on his toe and he's like, I would say, oh my God, he's got to be like 90% or 100% into his trail side. And then I look at the, the force plate data and he's shoving like heck through that toe and he's about 50-50. And yeah. so uh, you can, like you can, I mean, I think uh, launch monitors, a lot of people are like human launch monitors now, right? Because we've, we've watched yeah. golf swings and we've seen the thing and we can get pretty close with a lot of numbers. But I don't know if that'll ever be the case with, with uh, ground reaction force plates because you can't see kinetics with your eye. You can't see forces with your eye. Um, and, but what a launch monitor is measuring is basically kinematic properties, right? It's measuring angles. It's measuring velocities. It's measuring like – and so your, your eye is decent at measuring kinematics, right? Because it's a kinematic measurement tool. It is not a kinetic measurement tool. And so – I think that's why it's such an essential teaching tool that it like even the best in the world. Like I know I have heard a lot of people like, and I've played with this with people who've used launch monitors for a long time. I'll hit a shot and they'll have the data. I'll be like, what do you think that is? And they can get pretty close on most of those numbers. Right. But yeah. um, I guarantee you, I could fool some of the best in the world with some swings on the force plate. Like you look at it and you're like, there's no way I would ever guess that it would have been whatever it is. And so um, I think that's what, I mean, it's a, it's a good sales pitch for, <laughs> For the technology, yeah. right? Because it's. Uh... I, I just, I just think it's great. Um, I just think it's great. You, you could change something and have changed something that you can't see. And that's you know, that's literally that, the, that's the what you know um, makes it so interesting. Scott, yeah. we're we're gonna get kicked off in one minute forty one oh. seconds. Oh really? <laughs> okay. They kick us off after an hour. Oh okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> it don't seem like I've been talking for an hour. No, I went we're, quickly. We're, yeah. But you know what? It, it's been great to. I, I, I just love talking to people who are, you know, industry leaders in the different areas and and understand and um, discover what you know what what's happening, how things are doing, you know. And like I said, the biggest thing is, you know, we 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 are all different, you know. And now we can measure. Right, and I think that's the key thing. You you, you got to get better at measuring what's different and and not just giving lip service to it. Because I mean, yeah. I think a couple of years ago in the U.S. there was that ad with when Arnold Palmer died. And it was like, yeah. swing your swing. Don't swing anyone else's swing. But most people at home are probably like, what the hell is my swing? How do I know? Like, <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, it's figuring out what is that? Is it that matches your body and what doesn't? And, and that's, that's my goal with my research. Is to, and then making it useful to everyone. I don't want to confuse people. That's not my goal. So um, Got, hopefully we get there. Yeah, it's been brilliant. I, I really appreciate your time. All and, right. Uh, thank you, sir. It, well, it, let it, me know if you ever want to do this again. This is, I got all the time oh, in the world right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I really all right. appreciate it. Um, thank Take you. care, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.